Hope you're well, hope you're well. Hope you're well, hope you're well. Hope you're swell, swell, swell. Hope you're wavy. Hope you're gravy, gravy, gravy. Since it's Easter, I thought I'd um, do some Bible study pertaining to the death of Jesus. Should I read the whole chapter or just the part where he dies? Maybe reading the whole chapter will give you a little more context. Yeah, let me just read the whole thing. Got my glosses. Got my glosses. It's nice, don't get tired. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver on the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Imagine being Judas, man. Damn. Can't imagine. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the piece that they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and bought bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the bloody pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. <laughs> so they're trying to kill Jesus they're accusing him of a bunch of things he's in court and, and Pilate is trying to give Jesus an opportunity to defend himself and weasel his way out by denying anything and being like I never said that I never did it but Jesus is just he's just there just quiet just did, you know just like there like just come on bro, let's get this over with and Pilate's just like, what's wrong with this guy? Like, the whoa, they're going, to, they're going to kill you. Like, defend yourself. He's just quiet. He's just, shoop. Anyway, now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While they are sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which, one, which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Then Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on, and on our children. Ooh, not wise. Then he released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Scourged means like punished, like tortured or something. Scourged. Whip someone as punishment. Whip. So Jesus was whipped first, then he was crucified. Jesus was beaten and whipped and because the soldiers had beaten him prior to this and yeah people everyone had gotten a piece of this guy bro he'd been passed through the crowd and they'd had the way with him before he was ultimately crucified it was uh something else then the soldiers of the governor took jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him 
and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and, re and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on, on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Mm. So you can imagine the humiliation. Even like a crown of thorns, you have to put it on someone's head. Obviously the, thorn, the thorns are digging into your flesh. So it's painful just wearing the thing. And on top of that, they're beating him and spitting on him. And they're stripping him of his clothes because, you know, they put a robe on him to mock him like, oh, you're a king, right? And then they took off the robe and put his own, so he, you know, they're stripping him naked and putting on other clothes. And you can imagine the humiliation. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. What is gall? But when he tasted it, he would not drink. Gall meaning the contents of the gallbladder bile what no way dude Matthew 27 explained Uh, well, I want Matthew 27. Oh, my screen just blacked out random. But I need to get a new laptop. Keep watching these videos, liking, commenting, and all that sort of stuff so I can get money for a new laptop. Because this is... This is a... Uh, the word gall most often refers to a bitter tasting substance made of a plant such as a wor such as wormwood or myrrh the most famous biblical use of the word gall is in reference to a drink given to Jesus on the cross um, wine mixed with bitter herbs or myrrh created a potion that dulled the sense of pain the mixture of sour wine and gall was often given to the suffering to ease their pain and death. Ah. Okay, so it's not not gall from the gallbladder. That would be absurd. Why? How would you even get? How do you even get that out? Anyway, so this was. I think they were giving it to him to ease his pain, but he was like, "No, I don't want it." The mixture of sour wine and gall was often given to the suffering to ease their pain. Jesus refused this gall-laced concoction after he tasted it and realized what it was. In a supernatural display of courage, the Son of Man rejected anything that would numb the suffering he endured for our salvation. Sin against the Holy God required extreme punishment, and in order to completely fulfill his position as our substitute, Jesus wanted nothing that took away from that punishment. On the cross, Jesus became for us, Jesus became a sin for us. To accept wine with gall would lessen sin's punishment, and Jesus had become had come to bear the full brunt of God's wrath against sin, not to take an easier way out. The fact that Jesus was offered gall was prophesied thousands of years before Jesus was born. Psalm sixty nine verse twenty one records these prophetic words They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. This prophetic mention of gall is only one of the dozens of messianic prophecies in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Interesting. That's powerful. And beautiful. So he said, no, nah, I need to take the brunt of this. I need to take all of this. All the suffering, all the pain. 
So he tasted it. He's like, no, this has something in it. And then he's like, nah, I'm cool. Because he didn't want. Wow, that touches me. He didn't want to lessen the pain. He didn't want to lessen the suffering. Okay. Then they crucified him. So now we're back to the chapter. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him. Jesus is the king of the Jews. Then two rob robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. But keep in mind that this is the accusation they have, that he claimed to be the king of the Jews, that he claimed divinity. Essentially, he had committed no real crime. They couldn't find anything against him. And Pilate gave him every opportunity to deny the accusations against him, which was essentially he claimed to be the king of the Jews and claimed to be divine in some sense, right? Claimed to be God. He, came, he claimed to be God. And that, that was the, the ultimate crime that they wanted to kill him for. He didn't steal from anyone. He didn't hurt anyone. He didn't do anything crazy. He just made a bunch of claims. And they killed him for it. Insane. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were cross crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Hmm. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. But the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So in that moment in his humanity, he felt like, God, why have you forsaken me? He, the pain was, uh, was unbearable. The humiliation. Mm, let's see. Hoping the same looks like you tell me what's going on here. Anyway, mm, so I'm just looking for an explanation for this. Forty-five, forty-five. This guy's interpretation. This is said says here. Yeah, Jesus had known great pain and suffering, both physical and emotion, emotional, during his life. Yet he had never known separation from his father. At this moment, he experienced what he had not yet ever experienced. There was a significant sense in which Jesus rightly felt forsaken by the father at this moment. Hmm. So maybe because he had bought he he bore all that sin. God had turned away from him. And Jesus had before then never known that. I want to just go back a little bit. It says here, from the sixth hour darkness, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour there was darkness over all the land. Uh, the explanation says, from the Roman reckoning of time, this was approximately from 12 noon until 3 in the afternoon. This unusual darkness lasted for some three hours, much longer than any natural eclipse. This was not the entire time Jesus was on the cross, but the later part of that time. According to... Jesus was on the cross for a long time. He was on the cross for hours. It's torture. It's meant to... 
yeah, it, it's torture. You're meant to be there for hours and hours and hours. And if you don't die, they, they come with a spear and they stab you and kill you. Um, and then they bring you down. Um, so yeah, anyway. So those, uh, this unusual darkness lasted for some three hours, much longer than any natural eclipse. So there was darkness over the land. That was supernatural. Uh, the first three hours of Jesus' ordeal on the cross were in, in normal daylight so that all could see it, that it was in fact Jesus on the cross and not a replacement or an imposter. This darkness was especially remarkable because it happened during a full moon, during which time Passover was always held. held. And during a full moon, it is impossible that there be a natural eclipse of the sun. Uh, okay. Uh, the remarkable darkness all, all over the earth showed the agony of creation itself and the Creator's suffering. Uh, there's a quote here from someone. The darkness is the symbol of the wrath of God which fell on those who slew His only begotten Son. God was angry and His frown removed the light of, the, of day. The symbol also tells us what our Lord Jesus Christ endured. The darkness outside of Him was the figure of the darkness that was within Him. In Gethsemane, a thick darkness fell upon our Lord's spirit. Another quote here says, There was contemporary evidence for this unusual darkness. Uh, so some Oregon and Esibis quoted words from Phlegon, a Roman historian, in which he made mention of an extraordinary solar eclipse, as well as an, of an earthquake about the time of the crucifixion. So writings from around that time detailed this supernatural darkness. So... It can be viewed as evidence that something did happen that day that was very supernatural. This this darkness that couldn't have been possible during a full moon, but it's like a it was like almost like a solar eclipse that happened. Uh, so now it says your Phlegon, Roman historian, wrote in the fourth year of the two hundred second Olympiad, there was an extraordinary eclipse of the sun. At the sixth hour, the day turned into dark night so that the stars in heaven were seen and there was an earthquake. Hmm. Okay, so now we go back to him saying, Father, why have you forsaken me? There's a quote here. His moan is one, his one moan is concerning his God. It is not, why has Peter forsaken me? Why has Judas betrayed me? These were sharp griefs, but this is the sharpest. This stroke has cut him to the quick. So this is the one time Jesus complained. And it was because God had seemingly turned away from him. At this moment, a holy transaction took place. God the Father regarded God the Son as if he were a sinner. Mm. As the Apostle Paul would later write, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God could not look at him, he had to turn away. Because Jesus in that moment had borne all the sin of creation. Yet Jesus not only endured, endured the withdrawal of the Father's fellowship, but also the actual outpouring of the Father's wrath upon him as a substitute for sinful humanity. Hmm. Horrible as this was, it fulfilled God's good and loving plan of redemption. Therefore, as I can say, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. At the same time, we cannot say that the separation between the Father and the Son at the cross was complete. Paul made this clear in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself at the cross. There's a quote here that says, I even venture to say that if it had been possible for God's love towards his Son to be increased, he would have delighted in, in him more when he was standing as a suffering representative of his chosen people than ever he had delighted in him before. So the quote is saying that if it's possible for God to love Jesus more already, it would have been in his suffering because he was doing a good thing in sacrificing himself for humanity. Um, but in that moment, God had to turn away from him because He'd taken on the sins of, of humanity. He'd become that sacrifice. Usually they'd sacrifice lambs and all these sort of things. But now Jesus had become that sacrifice and he bore all that sin. And God had to turn away from him. 
Christ, Christ says, Father, uh, what's the quote? Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. Mm. So when, when he's saying that, it says the agony of this cry is significant. It rarely grieves man to be separated from God or to consider that he's a worthy object of God's wrath. Yet this was the true agony of Jesus on the cross. At some point before he died, before the veil was torn in two, before he cried out, it is finished, an awesome spiritual transaction took place. God the Father laid upon God the Son all the guilt and wrath of our, our sin deserved, and he bore it on him. He bore it in him perfectly. He bore it in himself perfectly, totally satisfying the wrath of God for us. As horrible as the physical suffering of Jesus was, the spiritual suffering, the act of being judged for sin in our place, was what Jesus really dreaded about the cross. This was the cup, the cup of God's righteous wrath that he trembled at drinking. On the cross, Jesus became, as it were, an enemy of God who was judged and forced to drink the cup of the Father's fury. He did it so he could not have to drink that cup. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3 to 5 puts it powerfully. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. Mm. We can imagine the answer to Jesus' question, why? Because, my son, you have chosen to stand in the place of guilty sinners. You who have never known sin have made the infinite sacrifice to become sin and receive my just wrath upon sin and sinners. You do this because of your great love and because of my great love. Then the father might give the, so end quote, then the father might give the son a glimpse of his reward, the righteously robed multitude of his people in heaven's golden streets. Quote, all of them singing their Redeemer's praise, all of them ch chanting the name of Jehovah and the Lamb. And this was a part of the answer to his question. End quote. So, he's doing this for a reason. Uh, he's doing this for our salvation, us being in heaven someday. You know, when we die, we believe we go to heaven. And Jesus, Jesus was doing this for this specific purpose. To, to, to place us in right standing in God with, with God so that we can have eternity with God. So that's why he was doing all of this. You know, so he's saying, why have you forsaken me? For this specific reason. So that they can be forgiven and given a place with me in eternity. So that's why Jesus bore all that sin. Okay, let's, let's, let's finish reading. Some of those who stood there when they heard this, heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone, let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So, 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 wait, so a lot just happened there. <laughs> so he was calling Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani, and people thought he was calling for Elijah. There's actually an explanation about that. Let me read it real quick. Uh, close the tab. Let's go to history and open it. There we go. It says here, sadly, Jesus was misunderstood and mocked until the bitter end. His observers thought he was thought it was an all an interesting test case to see if Elijah would actually come. As Jesus hung on the cross, his listeners misunderstood and by taking the part for the whole. He said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Not only did they get wrong what they heard, 
Jesus said Eloi, not Elijah. But they also only heard one word of what he said. This will not do for the true follower of Jesus. We will we hear not only one word from Jesus, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. One of the things we, we one of the first things we know about Jesus was that he was misunderstood. When Joseph and Mary left him behind at Jerusalem, they didn't understand that he had to be about his father's business. Now at the end of his or this ministry, he was also misunderstood on the cross, blah, 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 blah. Ah, I think we get the gist of it. He, he was saying Eloi, not Elijah. <laughs> so people thought he was calling for Elijah. He wasn't calling for Elijah. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's the gist of it. Um, and then... He cried out and yielded his spirit. It's leaving out the part. Uh, this is explained in another gospel. I'm not sure which one we'll, we'll tell. But when he he says it is finished, and then he gives up his spirit, but it just glosses over that here. But it, it is detailed in another gospel, uh, which is just another account of what happened that day. Um, so he, it says he cried out again, and with a loud voice, he yielded up his spirit. And there was an earthquake, which was you know detailed in those other accounts, like. I, I read we just now these aren't biblical accounts these are actual historical documents that were retrieved from that time period where people were describing a phenomenal darkness a very strange eclipse as well as an earthquake that occurred simultaneously and it says here that bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep though dead were raised again and they appeared to people so it was very supernatural what was going on this earthquake happened and people were rising from the dead and and walking around and appearing to people and stuff and yeah he may so when the centurion and those were with him and those with him who were guarding jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened they feared greatly saying truly this was the son of god and many women who followed jesus from galilee ministering to him were there looking on from afar among them among whom were mary magdalene mary the mother of james and joseph and mother and the mother of zebedee's sons okay. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the mother Mary sitting opposite the tomb, and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. Okay, so he's dead. Um, spoiler alert, he does rise from the dead again. But I don't, I don't want to re-roll that. It's, it's quite long. And uh, the video is already approaching 30 minutes. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll read it. Chapter 28. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. And the gods shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. So yeah, he rose from the dead. Unbelievable, amazing. Amazing story. Amazing history. And this is what, this is what separates Christianity from every other, other religion, is that God came down in the form of man and lived amongst us. He dwelt with us. He had the human experience. He knows what it's like to be us. And he endured more suffering than any of us will ever know. Um, for our sake. One of the accounts says, Father, forgive them. They know, what, know not what they do. When they tortured him and beat him and, and humiliated him in all those ways, he still had the kindness and love in his heart to say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. While he's on the cross, he's saying this. After he's been tortured extensively. And he gave up his spirit. So this is a God that uh, understands us deeply. He He's not just sitting up there, staring down at us. Like he actually came down in the form of a human being. He allowed himself to be born through a woman and 
live as a baby and grow and become a man. And he was hungry. He was tired. Um, he felt pain. He had the human experience and then allowed himself to be tortured and killed for our sake. Um, and all those who accept his sacrifice and profess his name and believe in him will be saved and have eternal life. That's, that's pretty much the gist of Christianity. And we follow in his footsteps and we try to model his behavior. That's what it's, it's all about. That's what it means to be a Christian. And that's what separates Christianity from every other religion. It's like, every other religion is like, what can you do for God? But it's like, Christianity is about like what God has done for us. You know what I'm saying? So, you can't work your way towards heaven. You have to accept the sacrifice that Christ does. And we believe that in that it's genuine acceptance, there's a supernatural occurrence in which your spirit is changed and your conscience is touched and you become sensitive to the ways of God and you follow Him. Um, but there's nothing you can do personally. You can't work your way towards heaven. You can't be good enough to make your way. So you, people think if I'm just a good person, that's enough. It's like, well, all, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the whole point. Like, you, if if you are good enough to go to heaven, Christ wouldn't have had to die to have to die on the cross. But uh, yeah, we need Him, and that's that's the quintessential thesis of Christianity. You know, and that's what separates it from every single other religion. Um, this God who suffered in our place and, and bore our sins, our iniquities for us and allows us into heaven through His grace and His mercy, through knowing Him. It's, it's, and it's a free gift. It's a, it's, it's a gift. It's free. Anyway, let me pray and get out of here. Hope you enjoy that. Dear God, thank you for this individual watching this channel. Thank you for making them whole, unique and guiding them on a path towards peace, prosperity and purpose. Thank you for blessing this person with wonderful people in their life who love them, take care of them, bring them to the best out of them and thank you for maintaining the ones that are there to do the same thing. Thank you for blessing this person with a spirit of gratitude so they can give thanks for all the wonderful things in life and by giving thanks they can find peace, contentment and attract even more blessings. Thank you for letting your presence be felt in this person's life so, that, so they know that you're gone, that you're, that you're loving them and you're always going to be there for them. Good health, long life and happiness over this individual and everyone they care about in your mighty name I pray. In Jesus name I pray. In Jesus name I pray. Amen, 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 am